Welcome you to another edition of our Anchored in the Word Morning Reflection. Hope that you had a good holiday season. <clears throat> we took some time off from our morning reflections during the Christmas holidays so that uh, we could just spend time with family. And so I'm glad to be back uh, recording our Luke study. And so if you could, let's take our Bibles and let's turn together to Luke chapter 2. And we will be looking at the section from verses 39 to 52. Luke chapter 2, verses 39 to 52. Here's what the Bible says. When they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, <coughs> they returned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. When he was twelve years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. <coughs> when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been with the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinfolk and acquaintances. When they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. It came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. All that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. When they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou dealt thus with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee, sorrowing. He said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? They understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And they went down, and he went down with them, and came to Nazareth, and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Now, when we come to this passage of Scripture, this passage is really one of the few passages that gives us any information about Christ's childhood. Really, if we're talking about from the time that he was a small child up until the time that he starts his earthly ministry, the Bible records almost nothing about him. And that's not something that should disturb us. The fact is that the reason that the gospel accounts are given is to demonstrate who Christ is and what he came to do. And so really his childhood time period is not a significant a part of his ministry. But in the book of Luke, we do see that Luke gives us some information that really helps us to understand the, hum the humanity of Christ and help us to understand a little bit about how we have God in flesh developing as a child and really demonstrating that he is the Messiah even before he begins his public ministry. So with that in mind, let me give you a simple summary statement, and then we'll dig into some of the content, uh, the details that we find in the passage. A summary is this. This section of Luke links the infancy and the early childhood of Christ to his public ministry, giving us insight into his dual nature and his willing humiliation. So what we're going to see is that this child is both God and man in one person. <laughs> We're going to see the willing humiliation of Christ. The fact that he's willing to lay aside his glory and he's going to take on humanity and he's going to experience the same kinds of limitations that normal people experience. Not just normal adults, but even normal children and normal adolescents. And so we see indication of that in these few verses. The first fact I'd like you to see this morning is that in many ways Christ was just a normal child. Now this doesn't diminish the fact that he's fully God, but we are talking about the fact that he's also fully human. And so when we analyze the humanity of Christ, we need to realize that Christ developed in his humanity just like any other child would have developed in the time period that he lived and today. We see that in verses 40 and 52. It says that the child... And by the way, he's referred to as a child, viewing him as someone who's not yet at that point of adolescence or manhood. It says the child grew and he waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. In verse 52, it says Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. In other words, he physically grew. He learned. He developed relationships. But the most important and significant thing that's stated there is he communed with his father. And when we talk about his father, we're not talking about Joseph. We're talking about God the Father. We're talking about the first person of the Godhead. 
Literally, what we see is that the first person and the second person are having fellowship one with another. And this is fellowship that they've enjoyed from eternity past, and this is something that he's enjoying as God in flesh. The second fact we see is that Christ grew up in a devout home, yet his parents didn't fully understand or comprehend the ministry that he would have. But what's very interesting is it's apparent in these verses that though his parents didn't fully understand his ministry, Christ already understood who he was and what he had come to do. In verses 42 to 50, we see several details about that. It says his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. When he was 12, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. It tells us that they stayed the entire time period. And when they were heading back, they were looking for Jesus amongst his 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 friends and his family members. So it would seem that the acquaintances that Mary and Joseph had and the family members that they had were also devout just like they were. We also see in verse 49, he says, How is it that you sought me? Wist ye not that I was about my father's business? And what's interesting is when we read this in our English translation, we see that father's capitalized. That's an indication that the translators understood. He's not referring to Joseph. He's referring to God the Father. It then says that they did not understand his saying when he spoke unto them. So some of the details that I want to kind of point out that are either explicitly stated or implicitly a part of this text is that, first of all, on a yearly basis, they followed the custom of the Jewish people and they went to Passover at Jerusalem. I want you to realize they spent the entire week there and it was nearly a 70-mile trip. So from Nazareth to Jerusalem, every year, they traveled on foot close to 140 miles. That is a significant task. That would have taken probably over a week just to travel there and back, and then they would have spent a full week there during the Passover week. We see that they traveled uh, as a caravan with their family and their friends. And we see indication that at 12 years of age, so Jesus has not yet reached the point where he would have been viewed as an adult who's responsible for their own decisions in the Jewish culture. He's right at that threshold. But at the age of 12, he's sitting there in the temple. He's interacting in a very intelligent way, in fact, in a way that actually made the teachers and the rabbis there in the temple, they really were impressed by his, his questions. They were, in quest they were impressed by the things that he was saying. In other words, we see that the Lord Jesus was someone who had been taught well the Torah and he had internalized the things that he had taught and he's demonstrating an, an, an acute awareness of what he's, what he's interacting with. We also see that when his parents talk to him or Mary talks to him and says, what are you doing? That she obviously didn't understand what Christ was trying to say. A fact there. A third fact that we find in this text is that Christ understood and demonstrated his fitness to begin his messianic ministry, even at a very young age. So in the Jewish culture, a person was viewed as an adult at a pretty young age. So in our country, you can vote when you're 18. You can get a driver's license when you're 16. Generally, you go to college when you're about 18 or 19, or you go into the workforce when you're about 18 or 19 years old. And so in our culture, we tend to think of people as adults at 18 years old, and then there are certain other responsibilities or opportunities that a person can have when they reach 21 years. Like, for instance, you can go and buy a handgun. So in our culture, we tend to see people as adults around 18 to 21 years of age who are fully responsible, and they're supposed to bear the full weight of their actions. Well, in Jewish culture, it would have been 13 years old. But what's very interesting is at this point, Christ is not yet 13. So he's still viewed as a child at this point. Yet what we see is that he's interacting in the temple, verses 50 to 52, and we see that, that the people are very impressed by the questions that he's asking. They are, they are very much aware that this is a young man who is sharp. He understands what he's talking about. He's asking great questions. He's giving tremendous insights. And what's very interesting is when he's talked to by, by Mary, he understands the fact that his father's business is not in Nazareth with Joseph, but it is doing the work of God. 
He understands his relationship to the Heavenly Father within the Godhead. And so he puts it this way. They understood not the saying which he spoke unto them. He went, excuse me, after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them, asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So it's not just that Christ is asking questions as the student. He's asking questions as the teacher. And he's giving instruction as the teacher. And so this is a phenomenal thing to consider. This 12-year-old boy is really presenting himself as the one who is the authority in the midst of all these doctors and these well-learned people in the temple. The fourth fact that we see is that in his humiliation, Christ experienced the normal limitations of childhood and the normal development from childhood into adulthood. We see that in verses 50 to 52. It says that Mary and Joseph understood not the saying which he spoke unto them, and he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart, and Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature with God and man. What that tells us is that Mary and Joseph didn't fully understand what Jesus was saying. He submitted himself to them in spite of the limitations that they had. He developed physically, mentally, and relationally. And so when we see all these things about Christ's childhood, really from the time that he's a baby until the time that he becomes a rabbi of age, 30 years old, and he's instructing and teaching, and he begins his messianic ministry, what we see is the humiliation of Christ, we see the, the, the humbling of himself, the development of his humanity, and we see that he was willingly subjecting himself to his mother and to Joseph. So here's the question. What can we learn from the text in front of us? How can we take something practical out of this passage? Let me share with you two practical thoughts that I jotted down today that I hope will be an encouragement to you. The first is this. Christ willingly humbled himself in order to redeem us. This story tells us that because Christ was willing to take on human flesh and take on the limits of being a man, the Lord Jesus Christ was able to redeem us from the curse of our sin. In Philippians 2, 7 and 8, it says, He made himself of no reputation. He took on him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found and fashioned as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The most practical thing that we can take away from this is that we see the humiliation of Christ ultimately so that he can redeem us unto himself. The second practical insight that we see is that Christ can comfort us when we are tempted because he understands by experience. In Hebrews 4.15 it says, We have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly before the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That tells us that it's not just that God is available to strengthen us, but literally the Lord Jesus Christ can identify with us. He understands by experience what it means to be misunderstood, what it means to submit to someone who's in the wrong, what it means to humble oneself and to not put oneself forward. He understands what it's like to develop and to grow physically and relationally and mentally. He understands what it's like to suffer and he understands what it's like to be hungry and to be tempted and to be mistreated. The Lord Jesus Christ can comfort us because he understands by experience. And so when we look at Luke chapter 2 and the final section of that, in those few verses that talk about the childhood of Christ, we're reminded that the Lord Jesus Christ is God in flesh, perfect humanity. The Lord Jesus Christ walked amongst people and experienced the hardships of living in a fallen world, not just to redeem us, but also to be able to sympathize with us when we walk through these same challenges ourselves. I hope that this will be an encouragement to you today. I hope that you have a great week. 
and I'm looking forward to getting back into our studies in Luke, and I hope that these uh, these little devotionals will be an encouragement to you. Let's bow for prayer, and then I hope you have a great day. Father, thank you for the opportunity to look at this short passage dealing with the childhood of Christ. Help us to recognize that it is because of Christ's willingness to leave his throne in heaven and come to earth and take on flesh to dwell amongst us. We can be redeemed by his shed blood on the cross and we can be comforted by the fact that he has experienced the same infirmities that we experience in a fallen world. We ask that you'll strengthen people through this and we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. We'll hope that you have a great rest of your day and Lord willing we will continue our study tomorrow. Bye now.